What is up, you beautiful people? Welcome back to the Built on Bitcoin podcast, where we cover all the innovation happening across the Bitcoin ecosystem. So you'll typically find me either giving updates on the latest happenings, or more importantly, talking directly to the builders who are in the trenches, building stuff across all the different pieces that is the Bitcoin ecosystem. And so today, I have a fantastic conversation with John Light. So John, he describes himself as a professional Bitcoiner. He's been in Bitcoin for over a decade. Currently, he contributes to the Sovereign Protocol. But recently, he put out what is probably the most in-depth research into rollups, specifically on Bitcoin. So this is a big topic. You may have heard these as zero-knowledge rollups on something like ETH. And there's a component of that, the the zero-knowledge component of a rollup. But in this, you'll hear that hear it described as a validity rollup more commonly, and that's what we talk about. It's it's typically touted as one of the best and most likely scaling solutions for Bitcoin that crosses so many of the boxes people want. So we get into the weeds somewhat about that. I kept it more overview because there's a fantastic interview he did with Kevin Rook, who's a fellow podcaster on the same topic and they go much deeper and I really like that interview. So if you want to go in the weeds after this one, highly recommend check out that episode with Kevin Rook and John Light. But that's what we have today. So we're talking to John Light, this one was fan fantastic. If you're curious about where Bitcoin is going in the future and how it can scale to much more people while still maintaining its key properties, things like privacy, uh this one you're gonna love. So without further ado, But first, a quick word from our sponsor. We all know Bitcoin is for the innovators, the revolutionaries, and the builders looking to build a better world for themselves and for the next generation. We also know the saying, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is right now. The same thing applies to building on Bitcoin. If you want to come build with the most active developer community building new use cases for Bitcoin, then it's time you make the leap to learning Clarity. Clarity is the Stack's smart contract programming layer, which enables us to work on DeFi, smart contracts, and so much more, all built with the safety and security that comes with Bitcoin. Start today by going to start.stacks.org. Start.stacks.org has a five-step journey that will take you from complete Stacks novice to teaching you Clarity, all the way to finding a job with a Web3 Stack startup. Don't wait another month, year, or decade waiting to get involved in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Start building on Bitcoin today. Go to start.stacks.org to start learning and building today. Thank you to my sponsor as always. So without further ado, let's jump into this conversation with professional Bitcoiner, John Light. Welcome to Built on Bitcoin. John, how are you doing today, my man? Doing great. Thanks for having me on, Jake. I'm uh, excited to talk. And, you know, from what I know, like I'm I'm newer to the Bitcoin space. I've been here for about a year, year and a half. But you start to see names. Thank you, sir. I guess that's that'd be your first question to ask real quick. Is like how's the how's the bear market been for you? How many cycles have you been through? How are you feeling right now? Um, I've been through um, more than a few cycles uh, by now. So uh, you could say I'm a grizzly old Bitcoin veteran. Um, you know, one of those just you know zenned out like. Bitcoin, it's way better, doing way better now than I could have anticipated it was, you know, this length of time from from when I um, first got interested in it. So um, I'm I'm very happy with where Bitcoin is and where it's been going. And uh, yeah, there's there's a lot to be excited about. Yep. Okay. very cool. Yeah, this is my first cycle. And it's like, the fact it's quieter feels kind of weird, especially as like a content creator. But ultimately, like no loss of conviction. Like I just love everyone's heads down building. The fundamentals are still there. Like it's it doesn't matter at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if anything, that quiet time gives that additional breathing room for 
having deeper conversations, um, you know, going further into the weeds on different topics and not kind of getting distracted by the, the hype and the noise and, and, you know, all the, all the tourists that come through. So, you know, that's not to say, you know, the, the bull season doesn't have its, you know, benefits and its fun moments, but, uh, but yeah, I, I like this time for, uh, for building and getting to build a, a stronger, more cohesive uh, community. Couldn't agree more. It's very well said. Well, I'd love to jump into this. We got a lot to talk about. I think the big topic of the day is this research paper you put out on the feasibility of rollups on Bitcoin and kind of the, some of the nuances of that. But before we get into that, I'd love to, you know, Bitcoin is such, it touches people in so many different ways. You could be coming in from like the technical side, from the economic side, from the sovereign individual side. And, uh, so that's just, it's just crazy to me that you can ask a simple question, like what fascinates you about Bitcoin and get so many different answers. And so that is my question to start with is like, you know, what, what do you find so fascinating and interesting about Bitcoin? The answer has probably changed over the years, but I think the, the core of what excites me and inspires me about Bitcoin hasn't changed much, which is to have a stateless, decentralized electronic form of money um, is very exciting to me. Uh, If that idea first attracted me because I saw what was happening in the, with the 2008 financial crisis and was very disappointed in how the government was like handling that situation, bailing out the banks, banksters getting huge, you know, bonuses and golden parachutes and things like that. Um, while my friend's parents were getting foreclosed on and losing their jobs and stuff. And it just, the whole way that all went down, didn't feel right. And I thought to myself, you know, if I I was just coming of age as an adult at the time, you know, finding myself thinking about my future and and all of that. And I, I was thinking to myself, you know, if I have an option, I would like to remove myself from that system as much as possible. Like I might not be able to, you know, single-handedly make that kind of system go away or stop that kind of stuff from happening, but I can at least remove myself uh, from participating in it. And so I started looking for alternative financial systems, alternative monetary systems, that kind of thing. And over time, eventually found Bitcoin. And I found that Bitcoin solved a lot of the problems of other alternative monetary systems that people were using or experimenting with at the time. And it struck me as something that had the potential to be the future of money. Like I I had this feeling that fiat currencies all have a shelf life. there's probably no fiat currency that's going to exist forever. Whereas because Bitcoin is not tied to any single country, any single political entity or regime um, or company, I thought that it had the potential to potentially be the, like the next evolution of money that, that could serve humanity forever or as long as, you know, humanity, uh, and and this kind of modern technology that we have exists. And that was extremely exciting to me. And I, once I realized that I decided like, this is what I want to do with my life. You know, I want to, I want to try to make Bitcoin fulfill its full potential and get it into the hands of as many people as possible. Um, And you tell, tell as many people as possible uh, about its benefits. So I started doing Bitcoin education I started working on Bitcoin startups and have been doing this uh, kind of Bitcoin evangelism, Bitcoin technology research um, ever since. That's great. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. Like we all had the same response to the 08 crisis. Like it was just such BS on so many levels. But through all of that, none of my thinking was the dollar was the problem. Like, it just seems so ingrained. Like, why would I ever question that? And so I, I'm curious, like, 
you know, you, you start to find out about Bitcoin and there's a jump from you understand technology to I'm going to spend my life on this. So I'm going to make this my career. You know, like I've been in crypto now working here for a little less than a year. And it was a big jump going from, you know, working at a grocery store or any kind of other side hustles I had to like being in Bitcoin or crypto. So what was that transition like where like you found out about Bitcoin, you know, you, you believe in the thesis of it to really starting to get involved at like a tangible level of putting that time and build stuff? Well, it was a period of education um, and getting myself to a point where I feel like I had solid footing to be able to even talk intelligently about it um, and, and to feel like I had something to say and to feel like I had the knowledge where I could actually help other people get into Bitcoin. Um, and so I was working at a, a media startup at the time and uh, going to school. I eventually dropped out of school to do the startup full time. And then at some point, like the Bitcoin bug just bit me so hard. I felt like, okay, I really understand this. I really understand like the potential here. Now I want to like dedicate my life to, to helping Bitcoin fulfill its, its full potential. And so I moved to San Francisco, which at the time was the closest thing that you could call to like a Bitcoin startup hub. Um, companies like Trade Hill and Coinbase were just getting started and, and based there in, in San Francisco. At the first Bitcoin meetup I went to there, uh, I met Brian Armstrong from Coinbase and uh, Jared Kenna from Trade Hill and just started networking with people in the Bitcoin community out there and met some people that I started working with. We started working on projects. People started raising money from investors and just through, you know, the sheer force of will, like carved out a place in the industry for myself and have been working on Bitcoin projects full time ever since. Love it. Love it. We are, we're thankful that happened. Um, well, yeah, I'd love to start to start to go down the rabbit hole of this research paper and roll-ups and Bitcoin scaling. Um, and for people that listen to this, there's a podcast you recently did because this is big. The, this Is it safe to say that this is the most in-depth paper on roll-ups on Bitcoin to date is the, the piece you just released? Yeah, I would say so. Okay, so the if you haven't seen or read the paper and you want to nerd out, it, it's BitcoinRollups.org, right? Yep. Yep. So that's a good place to go if you want to get in the weeds and hear it directly from John. Also, though, there's a fantastic podcast with John and Kevin Brook, who runs a podcast focused mostly, mostly on Lightning, but this was too important not to not to have John on. And they basically cover the podcast I was going to do. I had to outline. And I started watching this for for context, and he just hit all the questions I had, basically in the order I had. So it didn't make sense. I'm not going to double dip uh, and do the same podcast over and over. So for most people, go check out Kevin's podcast with John. It's fantastic. I think the way I want to attack this is more of a this is like a teaser, an overview for the person who like they just want to get the bite size of what this means in like a half hour condensed fashion. Um, and so I think it's good to probably start with. What is the current state of Bitcoin scaling in kind of all of its solutions? Like rollups are one option, but what is out there currently that's being considered by the community or technically feasible that you're aware of? Um, are you referring to protocols or, or you know, different features that um, aren't yet implemented or are you including even things that people could do with Bitcoin today? I would say both. Like if I'm looking at, uh, you know, tech that might be in the works 10 years from now, but we even are like vaguely aware of now. And if something happens mm -hmm. culturally or something, it could be possible. Rollups are one, you know, I don't know if drive chains and whatever is a thing to, to help serve mm -hmm. that. Like, what, What's the current landscape of that look like? Yeah, good question. So in terms of what people can do with Bitcoin today, there are 
a few different techniques and scaling is an important topic to cover on multiple layers of like the Bitcoin stack. So um, there are efforts at how to improve scalability at the networking layer, um, such as uh, compact blocks is a, is a technique that's currently in use, um, which is just a way to um, send less data um, between full nodes and miners um, so that they can get their blocks relayed across the network faster. Um, there are on-chain techniques. So there's ways that you can make more efficient use of your block space, um, such as transaction batching, which a lot of exchanges are using nowadays. So the old way of like making withdrawals from exchanges is that you know an exchange user would submit their withdrawal address and then the exchange would construct a transaction and send Bitcoin to the withdrawal address. And if you do that many, many times, you have to have many, many transactions, which takes up a lot of block space. Um, and so what, trans uh, what exchanges have switched to doing uh, is batching withdrawals. So rather than having one transaction per withdrawal, they'll have many withdrawals in a single transaction. And you save um, a lot of block space. The, the exact amount of block space depends on like a number of different factors, like how many inputs you need for your transaction and how many outputs there are and things like that. But, but uh, you, can, you can save a, a, a lot of block space compared to the, the old way of doing things. Um, and then there are some uh, protocols that are like off-chain protocols, um, which actually move transactions off-chain. And so Lightning is a, is a popular example of this, where users will do one transaction on-chain to open a channel to some counterparty that already ha is a, you know, in the Lightning network. And then... Once they have that channel open, they can send payments to that counterparty or other people that their counterparty is connected to and people that their counterparty is connected to who those people are connected to. So it, it creates this big kind of spider web uh, network of liquidity that people can send payments to off chain. So those transactions don't have to ever touch you know the blockchain and that uh that you know saves a ton of space uh, basically every lightning transaction that's ever happened never touches the blockchain um and 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 people only have to go back on chain when they want to close their channel or they need to rebalance their liquidity in a way that can't be done through lightning directly or something like that I've had one of my oldest channels, I think has been open since like 2018. So all of the payments that I've done through that channel, it's like those, those transactions haven't touched the chain in, in four years. So it's, uh, you know, you can imagine how much block space that has saved. Um, and then you multiply that by everyone that uses lightning and you, you can think of there's a huge amount of savings there. So there's a lot of stuff that's already being done to um, like scale Bitcoin. And then there are some more futuristic techniques, things that you can't do with Bitcoin today, but people are proposing as you know could be possible if we made some changes to Bitcoin, usually with a soft fork. Um, so you mentioned drive chains. Drive chains is one way that we could get more transactions. They won't have the exact same security model as Bitcoin, you know, using Bitcoin on chain today. Um, but you know, Lightning doesn't have the exact same security model as Bitcoin either, and so you know some people find that that security uh, trade off acceptable. Um, but drive chains are basically uh, uh, new blockchains that you can move your Bitcoin over to in a kind of trust minimized way, and then do a bunch of transactions on this other blockchain that um, Bitcoin main chain full nodes don't have to validate. They don't have to validate. They don't have to replay these transactions. They don't even need to know these, these transactions are happening. So it's similar to Lightning in that way, 
where you're moving the transactions off chain somewhere else where layer one full nodes don't have to know about or store these transactions, verify these transactions or anything like that. Um, and drive chains is a very interesting protocol. Um, there are a few different dips that would, would enable uh, drive chains. Um, there are techniques like um, opt CTV um, or BIP 119, which Jeremy Rubin tried to activate earlier this year, um, which has some scaling benefits. Um, it could enable um, new, more efficient uses of block space, uh, particularly for exchanges or opening lightning uh, transactions in bulk um, in, in ways that are uh, aware of or sensitive to um, block space congestion during periods of high load on the blockchain, uh, rather than having to put all of these transactions on chain and, um, and, and take up all this block space at the same time. Instead, you can just put a hash on chain and then once uh, so the, 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 the Bitcoins are basically owned by the recipients at that point in time, but then the recipients can claim the Bitcoins. So basically like unroll the hash into like a, a tree of transactions um, to actually claim the Bitcoins at a later date once the, the block space congestion has cooled down and transaction fees are, are lower. So this is, this is a way that you can that that exchanges and and other like large lightning service providers um, can make more efficient use of block space even during periods of of high um, congestion, so that they're not slowing down withdrawals or or um, lightning uh, channel um, you know recipients uh, from onboarding. They're just uh, they're just they're just delaying um, when when those transactions actually um, can be claimed by by the recipients. Um, so the OpCTV is is interesting. Um, there's also a technique called signature aggregation that some people are working on, where you can take the transaction or the signatures on transactions in a block and then like smush them together. So instead of requiring, you know, say, you know, 10 or 20,000 bytes or even more, you know, for a bunch of signatures in a block, you can compress that down to essentially like the size of a single signature, um, which would just be, you know, maybe a few hundred bytes. Um, and so that would significantly free up space in blocks for more transactions. Um, there's really like quite a, a large landscape of, of protocols, honestly. So I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, but, you know, if anybody's interested in going further down the rabbit hole of like Bitcoin scaling solutions, feel free to like you know, send me a tweet or, or, or something like that. And, and I can send some links to uh, to more resources to check out. OK, now that's that's a perfect overview. And yeah, if you want to find him on Twitter, it's at Litecoin. Um... Yeah, this is where I feel like I read, I try and read the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. And typically I'll just like skim for like the biggest things that I can 10% understand. But this is the stuff in Bitcoin where it's it's in the weeds, it's super technical. And it's it's crazy because the limitations of Bitcoin, like the block size and et cetera, it allow it forces you to do things like this. So you can't build a different crazy kind of L1 that just at the base level doesn't do the right things for decentralization or whatever. And so it's it's just kind of when I hear about these things, it just kind of makes me pause and it's amazing to see like so much innovation happening inside this bounded space and just trying to do so much at the at the fringes, whether it's BIP 19 or roll up to drive change, it's 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 fascinating. Yeah, it's not sexy, it's not flashy, but it's to me it's art. I mean, it's it's really amazing what the engineers in the Bitcoin developer community are able to do within the constraints that they've been given by Satoshi and the rest of the Bitcoin community. 
Um, and you know, to the broader Bitcoin community, I think it's it's really admirable that people have been so um, so committed to, let's say, keeping blocks small or ultimately for the purpose of decentralization. Um, whereas so many other chains are willing to push further and further in the direction of centralization. And I think that that experimentation um, is legitimate. Like, you know, they're, they're not trying to be Bitcoin. There's something else. And they're testing the, the boundaries of like, how far can we push this before it becomes dangerously centralized? I'm happy that those experiments are happening. But I'm also happening that we have a community like Bitcoin and that it is Bitcoin in particular that is, um, yeah, so strongly committed to decentralization because it gives us, um, you know, I think, very like sane constraints to like uh, fit our engineering um, into and uh, forces us to think about just how we can use the limited resources that we have. Um, as you know, Bitcoin full nodes and and the network as a whole, uh, as efficiently as possible, and and trying to squeeze every you know the maximum amount of value into the, into the smallest number of bytes. I think that's I think that's a yeah just a, a really cool um, constraint to work within, and um, I think validity rollups are are consistent with that. Perfect. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the things that make us so like inspired and in awe is when something like you have physics which has its own limitations and then someone kind of like pushes against physics whether it's like the human body or the human mind or the code base that has these these constraints and you say okay cool i'm gonna build it to the edge of that as far as i can inside the box it's it's very cool and uh mm -hmm. yeah so so jumping into roll-ups then and we're, we're breezing through. We're going to approach an hour real quick, no problem. But uh, <laughs> I try and keep this a half hour, but there's just too much to cover. So let's jump in then. You you gave like seven or so interesting things currently in development, people are working on and, and exploring. But the one you didn't touch on is rollups. So yeah, give us give us kind of the overview of what a rollup is in the context of Bitcoin. Sure. So a rollup is a blockchain that you can trustlessly transfer your Bitcoins to and then back to the, Bitcoin, the main Bitcoin blockchain. And the way that uh, this is, I, I should say, there's not really any other protocol that gives you that uh, benefit um, with, the, with the same, um, let's say, flexibility as validity rollup. So this is a, this is a unique uh, protocol in that regard. Um, and the way that rollups enable you to do that is using two tricks. One is that they store um, a, a compressed version of their transaction data. So basically all of the transactions that are happening on the rollup blockchain get compressed and then put into a layer one Bitcoin block so that the data remains available as long as that block is, you know, seeded by the Bitcoin network. And that's important because of the second kind of trick that the valid that the rollup uses to enable you to, to trustlessly get your Bitcoins in and out, which is a validity proof. And a validity proof is a cryptographic proof that, as the name implies, proves the validity of the transactions that are happening in the rollup block. So basically, you can move your Bitcoin into this other blockchain, do some transactions. The rollup block producer is going to bundle those transactions into a block and then put the transaction data and then a validity proof that proves that all of those transactions are actually valid. They put that validity proof and the rollup transaction data onto the layer one Bitcoin blockchain. And then layer one full nodes 
they don't have to execute all of those transactions that happened on the rollup. They just verify the validity proof. And if the validity proof comes back with a check mark and says, yep, all of these transactions are valid, then that rollup um, block transaction is itself considered valid and the rollup block is confirmed both on the rollup and on the layer one Bitcoin blockchain. And what this enables is that when you deposit your Bitcoin into a rollup, the rollup full nodes are going to be looking at the, the deposit contract on Bitcoin layer one, and they're going to see, okay, some Bitcoins just came into the deposit contract. We're going to now issue an equivalent number of Bitcoin to that Bitcoin address on the rollup. So you send some Bitcoin to the deposit contract, and then those Bitcoins appear in your address on the rollup. And you can send those Bitcoins around on the rollup just the same as you would um, send Bitcoins around on, on, on Bitcoin layer one. And then once you want to get your Bitcoins back out onto the layer one blockchain, you submit a withdrawal transaction. And then um, the withdrawal transaction is going to come out of the rollup contract on Bitcoin layer one. Now, the, the challenge becomes, how does Bitcoin layer one know that the withdrawal transaction that's coming out of the rollup contract on layer one is actually valid? How do they know it's not just somebody else saying, yeah, I own these Bitcoins over here, give, give them back to me? Well, they use that validity proof because the validity proof is going to prove that the withdrawal transaction is valid. And if the validity proof itself isn't valid, then the withdrawal transaction is going to get rejected and it's, and, and it's not going to happen. So nobody can fraudulently take coins out of the rollup. They can only take coins out of the rollup if they actually own those coins. And this, um, this is in comparison to existing sidechain protocols that we have, such as Rootstock or Liquid, where this movement of Bitcoins to and from the sidechain is managed by a trusted federation. Like the same problem exists. It's just that today, Bitcoin layer one has no way of verifying whether or not the withdrawal transactions coming out of the sidechain address are actually valid or not. And so validity rollups using this on-chain data availability uh, in combination with the validity proof provides that security and that trustlessness to ensure that the only people who can withdraw coins from the rollup are actually the current owners of those coins, according to the, the rollup. And another benefit that you get from this protocol is that it fully inherits the double spend security of the layer one blockchain. So the exact same amount of double spend security that you get from sending Bitcoin from one layer one address to another layer one address, you also get when you send Bitcoin from a one you know, a, a layer two rollup address to another layer two rollup address. Like you're, you're getting that full double spend security from 100% of the hashing power on Bitcoin layer one, which again, the sidechain protocols of to today um, don't, don't have. Liquid uses a federation for consensus. Rootstock uses merged mining. And even if they had 100% of Bitcoin miners mining um, their sidechain, it's actually still not 100% of the, the security of Bitcoin um, because the sidechain can be reorged independently of, of Bitcoin layer one. Whereas with rollups, if you want to reorg a transaction on a validity rollup, you also have to uh, reorg the layer one block that that 
uh, transaction was confirmed in. So to summarize, with a validity rollup, you have this separate blockchain that inherits the full double spend security of your layer one blockchain, Bitcoin. And it has a secure bridge that you can use to transfer your Bitcoin into this other blockchain, do some transactions, and then have a strong guarantee, just as strong as your ownership guarantees on layer one, that you and only you can withdraw your Bitcoins and get them back on a layer one Bitcoin address. Okay. Hmm. I want to... I want to take a step back to the beginning a little bit and make sure I understand kind of like thematically how this works. So you say it's a trustless exchange to and from Bitcoin, and people can kind of feel kind of what that looks like, whether it's Lightning, which uses just cryptography to do back and forth, or like you mentioned with Liquid or RSK, there's some kind of other model involved. Um and then you mentioned it stores compressed version of data on the L1. And this is something that I've been trying to wrap my head around because most of my user base or my audience is more familiar with stacks and POX. And the way I've been trying to describe to newbies how that works is like, I'm thinking about like the Dewey Decimal System at libraries where you have this index card system and it can tell you where a book is. So that's like the block on the stack side. But Bitcoin doesn't know what's in any of those books it just knows where to point to at that level of the roll-up is that does that analogy hold any water does that make any sense as far as how the bitcoin layer is compressing the data not exactly so the full state or at least the state diffs that is you know like yeah, this may be getting a little bit too technical, but let's just say enough data to be able to reconstruct the current state of the rollup from Genesis is stored in layer one Bitcoin blocks. So it's you're storing quite a lot more data than you would with the Stacks uh, consensus system. And the reason why rollups require so much data to be stored on layer one is so that the users always have enough of the data about the current um, validity rollup state to be able to produce their own validity proof and get their coins out of the validity rollup. If for some reason the validity rollup block producers are trying to censor them or you know have completely gone offline, are completely uncooperative whatever. Like if the rollup is completely failing them, they're not able to get a withdrawal transaction confirmed on the rollup, then what they can actually do is they can go directly to the layer one rollup contract and use the data that has been put in the layer one blocks about the state of the rollup to produce a validity proof that basically says, I own this much Bitcoin in the current state of the rollup. I would like to withdraw that Bitcoin to this Bitcoin address. And then they get that withdrawal transaction with the validity proof confirmed on the layer one blockchain. And the layer one full nodes are able to verify that validity proof and process the withdrawal transaction. So without that data, they wouldn't be able to produce that validity proof because they just don't have enough information to be able to cryptographically make that statement. Like, this is how much Bitcoin I own and I'm going to mathematically show you why that is true. Um, it's, it's, just a, it's, a, it's just a mathematical reality of how these cryptographic proofs work. Got it. But that's, that's how you're able to get that secure Bitcoin bridge where you can move Bitcoin into the rollup and then have that very strong guarantee that you can always get your Bitcoin back out onto the layer one Bitcoin blockchain. There's no other protocol um, that can do that. Okay, that's no, that, that that's super helpful and fascinating. This is where I gotta pause myself because I want to nerd out about what you just said for like 20 more minutes. But I'm gonna pause and keep it keep it uh, more of an overview. Maybe it's it's a good time for people to go jump into Kevin's podcast to do a deeper dive. Um, 
a few more questions we'll kind of dance around here at this point is everyone's heard about ZK rollups up to this point. It kind of has like name brand recognition almost. And you've chosen to, to you, you call it validity rollups, which I'm, I'm sure you're choosing your words very wisely. So what's the difference between those two things or is there any? In practice, there isn't. A lot of people use the term ZK rollup to refer to validity rollups. Um, and I don't know how this got started. I think people originally kind of conflated validity proofs with ZK proofs or zero knowledge proofs. And so when it came time to use these types of proofs in a rollup context, they just said, oh, we're using zero knowledge proofs in a rollup. This is a ZK rollup. It's a zero knowledge rollup. But technically speaking, a lot of the proofs that are actually being used in ZK rollup protocols are actually validity proofs. They're not zero knowledge proofs. Um, you can use zero knowledge proofs to create a validity proof, but not all validity proofs are zero knowledge proofs. And so if we want to be technically accurate when we're talking about specifically the proofs that are proving validity of these um, roll-up state transitions, we would call those validity proofs. Some of them might be zero knowledge proofs and it might be technically accurate to call them zero knowledge proofs, but just so that we can speak generally about this without getting into the implementation details, um, you know, I decided to use validity proofs because it, it refers to the broadest possible number of different implementation options. And this is also the term that um, Starkware prefers to use and it's a term that is gaining favor, generally speaking, in the research community, I would say, because of this technical distinction. Okay, that's that's super helpful. Okay, um, we're going to jump ahead. This is a, there's a natural question here to ask about the validity proofs and how they get proved. I'm going to skip that. Um, I'm going to point people to Kevin Rook's podcast. You give a fantastic example of a Where's Waldo puzzle and how this can kind of... <laughs> How this can kind of work in that in that example, which was was super enlightening. I'm leaving that as a cliffhanger for people, so go check out that podcast. But I want to jump ahead, start to close this out slowly. Um, and I think one of the things that naturally comes up is Bitcoin is so resistant to change. You know, you see Bit 119, which kind of like came and I don't know where it is now. Bit 300's been on the sidelines forever, and there's all, there's this kind of obvious culture that. Bitcoin's hard to change almost to the point where it's like, it feels impossible sometimes. And so I think the natural question is like, this sounds super interesting. The benefits seem clear. How feasible do you think this actually is to implement? Actually, first question before we get there real briefly, how technically fleshed out is this tech currently? Like if, if people want to vote today and, and pass it on, is it ready? Um. No, I, I think that we probably have a few years of R&D ahead of us to figure out what is the best way to actually implement this on Bitcoin, um, to do due diligence on the existing validity proof systems that are out there and find out if any of them are really um, ready for Bitcoin, so to say, uh, you know, the, the level of uh, um, security and maturity and um, efficiency that maybe Bitcoin developers would be looking for. So there are validity roll-up systems that are in production, um, but you know, these systems are on the bleeding edge. And a lot of them have frankly kind of cut corners in, in, in on their way to getting to production. And so none of them are really at the level where they're like the you know in doing basically do, doing the full roll up security model um and and that's because they're kind of hedging their bets a little bit you know they're saying like yes we're building towards a validity roll up but the tech isn't quite ready 
we're going to put some guardrails in place so that if anything goes wrong, humans can intervene and maybe, you know, try to mitigate the, the potential damage. Whereas I think anything that goes onto Bitcoin, it doesn't really have that luxury. It has to be ready for mainnet. It has to be ready for, you know, to be used in a trustless way um, and, and a kind of immutable way um, once it once it gets deployed. And so I think just due to the way that Bitcoin engineering culture and, and, and standards work is that it's, it's just going to take a, a lot longer to get a protocol actually ready for mainnet. So one of the questions, I think Kevin asked me this, it might've been on a different um, show that I did recently, but I was recently asked, um, you know, how long do you think it'll be before this gets onto Bitcoin? And I said, like, optimistically, maybe within five years, but I could see it taking longer. If it happened faster, I think it's maybe possible, but that would be, you know, very optimistic, I would say. Um, but yeah, I think five years or maybe a little bit longer is maybe more realistic to getting something like this onto Bitcoin. Okay, perfect. You answered both my questions in one, one false swoop. So great job, John. Um, let me think. Now I had a question, it disappeared. So I guess we'll, we'll jump into my last one, which is not really, uh, it's Bitcoin related, but it's more of a personal question. Cause I like to ask, you know, I found in myself, it's actually hard to dream big. That's kind of my, my my thesis. Like it's hard it's hard to expand your worldview and actually think big. And so I have to put my, put people in a situation like you know five years from now, imagine everything's going swimmingly. Like roll ups are on Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the top dog. It's two million dollars a coin. I don't even know what would be a feasible crazy number in five years from now. What is what is John doing in, in that perfect future? What what are you what are you building working on five years from now that you'd be like overjoyed about? Oh, that's really hard to say um, just because of how how quickly things change in Bitcoin. I, I tend to take things, you know, <laughs> one day at a time here. But um, based on the outcome of the research that I've been doing, I am pretty excited about validity rollups. So I hope that I'm doing something at the time to help validity rollups get on Bitcoin uh, if they aren't already on Bitcoin at this time. If they are on Bitcoin, then you know I'm out there teaching people about the validity rollups that people have built. Um, maybe I'm working with a team to, you know, get adoption for their rollups um, or something like that. Like the 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 rollup use case is so flexible because really a validity rollup it's a protocol for moving Bitcoin to other blockchains. It doesn't necessarily define what those blockchains can do. So like the blockchain design space is very broad. Like people have designed all different kinds of blockchains doing all different kinds of things. Like you've got stacks with their clarity language. You've got Ethereum with the EVM. You've got Zcash with the zero cash protocol. You've got Grin with Mimblewimble. Like, like there are all of these different experiments going on with different blockchain designs. And all of those could be validity rollups. And so I'm most excited about improving privacy on Bitcoin because it's just a, a problem that has plagued Bitcoiners for so long. And so, you know, five years from now, I think it'd be really cool to be working on a privacy focused validity rollup that's bringing the zero cash protocol or maybe even something more private if something else has been invented by then um, to Bitcoin so that Bitcoin users can get trustless end-to-end -end encryption for their Bitcoins. And we can have like a true peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system built with Bitcoin. Perfect. Yeah, that is that is fantastic. It makes me think too about... Um, there is a lag between when the tech is like fleshed out and maybe put on Bitcoin and then implementations come out above that and like bring it fully to life. And I think you've seen this with like, it seems like I've heard this with Taproot where it's like what Taproot can technically do, 
versus what's currently out there, there's a huge, huge gap. I and mean, you, you need devs, you need people, you know, putting in mental cycles, trying out things, more infrastructure built out. And so it sounds like what you're saying is it's kind of like that, where where Taproot is right now, rollups will probably be two, where even though it gets maybe pushed into Bitcoin core, there's going to be that time of like education, tooling around for developers and that kind of thing to actually bring it to the masses. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that will that'll definitely be the case. Um, but uh, yeah, at the same time, there are a lot of teams that have experience with blockchain, like building blockchains already, and even building rollups. So maybe adoption of validity rollups will happen a little bit faster, just because people, you know, as as we're working on like getting validity rollup protocols onto testnet and things like that, you know, maybe people will just be excited enough to start building stuff in parallel. And once it goes onto mainnet, you know, you'll have you'll have people launching stuff on mainnet like shortly after that. Um, but uh, it could it could go a number of different different ways. So you know, we'll just have to see like how much traction this idea gets, how you know how many people get excited about it, how quickly the developer ecosystem develops on around it. You know, if a such an ecosystem develops at all, um, that kind of thing. So yeah. Personally, like I said, I'm really excited about this idea. I think it can bring a lot of value to Bitcoin. And I, I the best I can do is shows like this and try to convince other people of the same and and build a community around this. And yeah, let's let's make it happen and uh yeah, it, invent the the most optimistic future that you could imagine five years from now, ten years from now. Let's make it happen. I, I couldn't agree more. John, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for being a Bitcoin educator and researcher and builder. Any any closing thoughts that you want to close on that I didn't touch on before we bring this to a close? Not really. Um, I think I think we covered a lot of good ground. Um, like you mentioned, I'm on Twitter. If anybody wants to follow me at Litecoin, L-I-G-H-T-C-O-I-N. My website domain is very similar, L-I-G-H-T-C-O.in. If you want to check out my blog and like the things I've been writing about Bitcoin for the past few years. And uh, yeah, like let's keep the conversation going. Anybody who's interested in the lady roll-ups or any of the topics I write about, I'm always happy to have a conversation, get feedback. Like even if you disagree, I want to hear why you disagree. So like, yeah, um, I'm all about um, the conversation, the Bitcoin community. So let's keep it going. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Especially because like I'm, I'm Bitcoin focused now, but I came from stacks and you've always been one of those guys that's like down to engage, good faith debater. So I uh, appreciate you and all the knowledge you've dropped on Twitter and sparse, sparse pieces as I've seen you, but also this, this conversation. And uh, yeah, if people are curious about the, the research paper or rollups, bitcoinrollups.org. Highly recommend you check it out. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's it. This has been fantastic, John. Thank you so much, my man. Yeah, thank you, Jake. Welcome to Built on Bitcoin. I know that things don't always go your way, but I'll be right here waiting. I've been waiting now, but trying to figure out a way to make it out. Make it out, cause I don't think about everything going wrong. Oh,